Park in Houston, Texas, where tonight something's got to give. The Atlanta Braves and Houston Astros are tied 1-1 in the best of five National League Division Series. You will see game three tonight live right here on Fox. Along with Steve Lyons, I'm Josh Lewin. Welcome to game three. And you know, Steve, at the end of May, the Houston Astros were facing odds that were longer than your hair. They were 15 and 30. Now they're a team that nobody wants to face. Yeah, you know, this was a team that nobody cared about when they were 15 games under 500. Now they're a team after they started playing well that nobody wanted to face in the playoffs, and that's because of the top three guys in their pitching rotation. Now Clemens and Pettit grabbed most of the ha headlines during the regular season, but tonight's starter, Roy Oswalt, won 20 games this season. He also won 20 games last year. He's the only player in baseball to do that. So when you have a number three starter named Roy Oswalt, you're talking about the best three deep rotation in all of the playoffs. Now for Atlanta, you're talking about Jorge Sosa, and a lot of America is saying, who the heck is Jorge Sosa? Well, they're just sticking with that baby brave theme that they've been running all season long. Here's another guy with no playoff experience. But you know what? He's got a lot of poise for a young kid. He was 10-3 and on the season, 9-0 and on the road. But I'll tell you what, he's never been in a playoff game, and he's never faced the kind of atmosphere that he'll face tonight in Houston. Phil Garner says this is the loudest place he's ever been in when they're going well. Sosa among the Braves without any postseason experience. They are a young group all of a sudden, but here they are yet again. The Atlanta Braves in the playoffs, and tonight in Houston, Game 3 on Fox is coming up next. The Division Series on Fox, sponsored by VCast from Verizon Wireless. Broadband quality video on your phone. By the all-new Civic from Honda. It'll reverse your thinking. By Midas. Trust the Midas Touch. And by MasterCard. Now the Atlanta Braves are trying to prevent a fourth consecutive early exit from postseason play. They keep making it here, but recently they've been unable to stay very long. They are taking on a Houston Astros team that has become the first team since 1914 to make the postseason after being 15 games under 500. Pretty impressive. That was amazing. Two years in a row they put on a run like that. Of course, everybody remembers the run that they put on in in 04, the season where they went 36 and 10 over the last 46 ball games to get into the playoffs. Not quite as dramatic this season, but this was a team that was down and out after the first 45 games of the year. The Astros headed into the postseason now, Steve, with the same wild card adrenaline rush that, yeah, served them so well last year, served the last three World Series champions just as well, but that didn't exactly mean much to this year's Boston Red Sox, apparently. They were the wild card. They got swept pretty quick. Yes, they did, and, you know, when you look at the Astros this season, when you talk about adding Pettit back into that mix, he missed the playoffs last season because of the injury. This is a quite a bit... Not only a different team, but a much more dangerous team as far as their pitching staff is concerned. Popular saying around here in Texas, all hats and no cattle. The conventional wisdom in these parts, though, the Astros are all pitching and no hitting. 26th in the majors in batting average, but they are second in ERA. They've got to find some offense tonight against a guy they've only seen briefly. That is Jorge Sosa. And you've talked about him already, Steve. He's got electric stuff. He's got a record of 13-3. and three. The Astros have to find a way to get to him. Uh, and it's really tough on them, too, because he's not a guy that they've seen a whole lot of. You talked to Phil Garner before the game. He had to check out some stat sheets to figure out who he's facing tonight. It's tough when you don't know who you've got out there and you don't really know how to prepare for that guy. Roy Oswald, though, everybody's pretty much up to speed on Mr. Oswald. And baseball fans, we invite you to grab a cold, fresh Budweiser. It's game time. Roy Oswalt has 40 wins over the last two years. That's the most of anyone in baseball. As you said, Steve, 20 last year, 20 this year. Here's the Braves batting order that he will be facing tonight. Rafael Furcal gets it going. Then it's Giles and the Joneses. Adam LaRoche, Jeff Brancourt, Ryan Langer hands. Brian McCann and Jorge Sosa. This is pretty much Atlanta 2.0. The baby Braves, they've been called. A lot of fresh, young blood against Roy Oswalt tonight. Hey, look at the numbers that he threw up there again as we talked about in the open. How would you like to have this guy be your number three starter? Is ERA under three, has more wins at Minute Maid Park over the last two seasons than any other pitcher in baseball. And this is a hitter's ballpark 
Here's the scouting report. He just has electric stuff, especially when he's down in the strike zone. If he gets up, he has a little bit more trouble. We talked slip differential. That's, we're not talking about the back end of your truck. This is the guy who throws a 96-mile-an-hour fastball and a 70-mile-an-hour curveball. There's a big slippage of the differential there. And he can just outstuff you sometimes if he gets in trouble with that good, hard, sinking fastball and also the big, looping curveball. He can just work his way out of jams. Let's take a look at uh, how the Braves and uh, well, actually how the Astros first will cover the field. That is brought to you by State Farm. Willie Tavares in center. And there is a lot of center field here in Houston to cover. We'll talk about that as we go tonight. You've got Berkman in lane flanking him in left and in right. Mike Lamb gets the start at first base tonight. Biggio, approaching 40 years old, is still doing it at second base. Uh, Roy Oswalt, I guess the pop quiz, it seems to stump everybody. Who's got the better career-winning percentage, Clemens or Oswalt? And it is Roy Oswalt. In fact, only Pedro Martinez and Tim Hudson are better among active pitchers. I just think it's, it's amazing when you talk about certainly the career that Roger Clemens had and a reason why I truly think that he's the best pitcher in modern-day history when you look at the era that he's been pitching in, the offensive explosion that he's had to pitch in, and this same ballpark with Oswalt, you talked about more wins than anybody over the last two years at home. This is a hitter's ballpark. It's very difficult to pitch well right here. This broadcast also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your TV. Jeff Nelson, your home plate umpire, he says play ball. And we do. Strike one in Houston. Thursday night, John Smoltz got the Braves to this 1-1 tie in the best of five. Chop ball, Vigio. Got him. Well, it didn't take long to see the difference. We saw the fastball at 94, then the big old looping curveball down in the strike zone. You're going to pound a lot of balls into the ground trying to hit that pitch. Pitching ahead on the count is huge for any pitcher. They say the best pitch in baseball is strike one. And sure enough, when Oswalt is ahead of hitter, he's unbelievable. The stats bear it out, Steve. When he's 0-2, opposing hitters this year are hitting 145. 2-0. and It is 545. Marcus Giles looking at one ball, one strike. Oswalt is cut down on the walks. In fact, Houston's pitching the staff as a collective. The fewest walks in a non-strike season for this franchise since 1966. Jim Hickey took over midway through last season and has done a tremendous job with his pitching staff. There's another one of those harmless ground balls to the right side. Two down. Now you talk about a a rough assignment you get called up from the minor leagues as a pitching coach and the guys you have to work with are Pettit, Oswald, and Clemens. <laughs> a lot of people say hey piece of cake just throw your hat out there and get it done. But he has done a lot of work with all three of those guys in fact the entire staff as you mentioned Josh fewer walks this year than in any other time. You got to make people swing the bat and put it in play especially when you walk guys in this ballpark you're looking at a two three run homer quickly. Here is Chipper Jones and he can do that to you. No player has ever had a better batting average at this ballpark. Lifetime, Chipper Jones is sitting around 440 at Minute Maid Park. And he fires it out of play one and one. on the gun right there from Roy Oswald. <laughs> 97 with some serious late movement. Watch how far this ball tails and runs on Chipper. Can't catch up with it. Came back with the breaking ball and that's that split 
difference that you're talking about, I guess. You follow up 97 with 74, and Chipper Jones is guessing. I don't know if there's a more intense stare from any hitter looking back out at the pitcher than Chipper Jones will show you. He's already named one child Shea because he hits so well at Shea Stadium. I don't know if Minute Maid Park Jones is quite something he'd consider, but... Well, you know what he did? He's got four sons now. His most recent son was born about 13 days ago. Named him Tristan for Tris Speaker. <laughs> Lifted into left. Grabbed by Berkman and almost sailed by him. Oswalt out of the inning. The Division Series on Fox, sponsored by Bud Light, smooth and refreshing. Bud Light, great taste for your great time. The series tied one to one in the best of five. The Braves win in order against Roy Oswalt, and now here come the Astros against Jorge Sosa. Vigio leads it off. A Rookie of the Year candidate follows in Willie Tavares. Then Berkman, Ensberg, and Lamb, Jason Lane, Adam Everett, Brad Osmus, and the pitcher batting ninth, Roy Oswalt. Jorge Sosa was a library quiet 13 and 3 this year. And he deals to Biggio. Nobody talked about Sosa nationally, Steve. He was dealt from the Devil Rays at the end of spring training, even up for utility man Nick Green. Oh, another one of those death moves that the Braves and John Sherholt seems to pull off on a yearly basis. And you look at the job that Bobby Cox did this year as manager, no question manager of the year. And for my money, every year, John Sherholtz is the GM of the year. Here's a scouting report on Don't Call Me Sammy Sosa. Difficulty with his arm slot occasionally. If he keeps it in the same spot all the time, he'll have a lot of success. The ball tails away from him. If he doesn't, he's got a smolty type slider. It's nasty. And that last mark there. Vigio cranks it left field. A leap and it's off the wall. Vigio is on with a double. A fastball right down the middle of the plate. Vigio loves to hit that pitch. Anything middle in, he's going to hammer. He's become a dead ball hitter late in his career. Bagwell says all he does is go up there and look at the pull pitches into the Crawford boxes out there. The only problem with this one, he didn't quite get a lift. You see the effort by Langerhans out there. Can't quite get up on the wall. He is the best of the defensive left fielders that the Braves have. He just ran out of room. Tavares to the plate. The irony there, Steve, is Langerhans growing up here in Texas. He was a huge Craig Biggio fan. Tavares showing bunch. Langerhans telling us the story about trying to get Biggio's autograph in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, not to make Biggio feel old, but... That, that's where we're going with the Braves. You've heard it talked about already, I'm sure. It is a very young group. Well, it should just make Vigio feel bad if he didn't give it to him when he was in the third grade, fourth <laughs> grade, or fifth grade. Again, Tavares shows the bunt. He can sacrifice, but you know he can also reach on a bunt. He did that about 30 times this year. 30 bunt hits, 70 infield hits, and you got to think that at least a couple of those infield hits came when he was trying to sacrifice and he legged out a base hit. Both corner infield positions, both LaRoche and Shipper, playing down his throat. Now, Steve, getting back to your scouting report, you had thrown out the, the word Houdini, and I'm imagining this is the kind of Houdini-esque escape that Sosa's been known for this year. They talk about him being amazing at getting guys on base and then just wiggling out of it somehow. And looking at that kind of a jam right now, nobody out. BGO already on second base. See what he does. The bun has popped up. Back about five rows. Now, see, in this situation, when you have one strike, I think you've got to square around and bunt the ball. He's trying to drag this bunt 
and try to get a hit out of it. But he already had one strike. That's fine after one strike. Second time around, you got to make sure you get the job done. Square around, drop it down, give yourself up, and get the guy to third base. It's no longer a drag bunt situation. I don't care how fast you are. Tavares had only three home runs in 152 games played this year. But the first of those three, the first of his big league career, was off of Sosa. So no, he didn't get the bunt down, but here he is asked to swing. He did do it. Make a nice effort in that last swing to try to drive the ball to the right side of the field. He has to get Biggio over here somehow. Corner, down he goes. Lance Berkman will come up next, but first let's check out how the Braves cover the field. Brought to you by State Farm. All about the kids. Langer hands in left. Francoeur in right. LaRoche at first. McCann is 21. He's catching. But don't forget you got Chipper Jones and Andrew Jones still running around out there, and they're pretty good. So is Lance Berkman. Down year for him by his standards, but he had 24 home runs. Getting away from McCann, it hit him. It hit Berkman. Well, we talked about that arm angle, the arm slot that Sosa has to stay consistent with with the release point. He's a three-quarter arm thrower. Hit Berkman right off the big toe of his left foot. Sometimes it's very difficult for a pitcher with a three-quarter arm slot delivery to keep it there all the time. You'll always hear about guys dropping their arm a little bit. It's even easier to get into that habit when you're not an over-the-top thrower in the first place. And Steve, here's where being at Houdini will come in handy for Jorge Sosa. He's facing Morgan Ensberg with two on. Big rip at a foul. Josh, if you're an over-the-top kind of guy, you, your release point stays right here pretty well all the time. When you're a three-quarter guy out here, once you start to get tired and this thing drops down here, the ball tails on you into, into the right-handed hitter. It's really tough for you to keep that arm slot in the same spot all the time. And remember, this kid started off as a minor league outfielder, spent six years in the minor leagues as an outfielder. Hasn't been pitching all that long. Sosa simply another lump of coal turned into a diamond by Leo Mazzoni and these Atlanta Braves. Sosa arriving in Atlanta with a lifetime record of 11 and 26. An ERA of 5.2 and he pulled on that jersey with a tomahawk on the chest. And it may as well have been an S on his chest for Superman. 13 and 3. talk about the job that Bobby Cox and Leo Mazzoni and John Sherholtz have done with reclamation projects, guys that they get. Jarrett Wright comes to mind last season. The job they did with him. Sosa this year. Got waved by the Brewers. That ball strokes foul. Now, Sosa got his opportunity when Mike Hampton, the former Astro, went down due to injury. Now, he spent six years in the minor leagues as an outfielder for the Rockies. Then the Mariners got him. They converted him to a pitcher when they drafted him on a Rule 5 draft in the 2001 season. Then the Brewers got him in a Rule 5 draft. They waived him. Devil Rays picked him up, and now here he is. You know, Morgan Ensberg at the plate here. Not exactly the same story as Steve, but Ensberg's a guy who was a walk-on in college before he got his scholarship at USC. And when he was eligible for the draft after his junior year, every team passed on him. He had his all-star caliber first half this year. He was not voted to the all-star game. He only went after Scott Rowland got hurt.
Bird comes through. He jerks the slider into the corner, and the Astros are on top. Wow, Josh. Watch the little Louis Tiant move you're going to see out of Sosa. I don't know if you're ever going to see that too much more often because look where the pitch location is. Very hittable for Ensberg. He went down and got it. Ensberg's a pretty good low ball hitter for a right-hander. Every once in a while, you'll see a pitcher try to use some deception with some kind of off-the-wall delivery. But when you spin around like Louis Tiant used to do and then deliver a double or a run-scoring double, you might not see that again the rest of the game. Here's something else you don't see that often. Mike Lamb getting intentionally walked. 236 hitter this year. It's his first plate appearance of this division series. And the Braves want to set up a potential double play with Jason Lane. This is not the kind of start that the Braves had envisioned for Sosa. Let us get you down to the third member of our broadcast team, Chris Myers. Hey, Josh, the Astros trying to take full advantage of home field. Even though it was a picture-perfect October night outside, the roof just closed here. They've won four or five postseason games with the roof closed. The pitchers like the controlled conditions. But Phil Garner said the noise is the real reason. We feed off the intensity of the crowd and the energy. Like right now, Bobby Cox said, hey, in a football game, the noise matters. I tell my players, pretend they're cheering for you. Boy, they were set to cheer for Jason Lane right there. He just clubbed it. And it hit one of the stanchions up there. It was actually caught by Chipper Jones, but that's a dead ball. I don't know if Chris Myers was that good. As soon as he started talking about crowd noise, the plays <laughs> went nuts. He's no Houdini, but he's pretty good. Well, we're going to find out if Sosa continues to be Houdini. He already gave up the run-scoring double. He's in serious trouble right now. He has had a history of being able to work out of these gyms. Matter of fact, Steve, with the bases loaded this year, opponents are one out of 16 against Jorge Sosa. has got it on the sack fly 2 nothing. guys that had a very quiet year. Jason Lane was one of them. Drove in 78 runs this year. Very similar to that at bat right there. Tough two strike count. Went up and got a high fastball away from him. Drove it into the outfield in order to get that run scored. Must be something about USC baseball players. He was also <laughs> a guy that went to school with Morgan Innsberg. No one wanted to draft him either. Here is Adam Everett. And Adam Everett to left field. Hangs in the air. Langer hands has got it. It is 2-0 Houston at the end of one with Andrew Jones coming up. Hey, I'm an Astros fan. I'm famous for my whistle. It sounds like... It will be Astro Mania all over this house. Astros win. Astros win. I live for this. Watch the World Series on Fox. Don't miss it. Houston has scored in the first inning once again. They've done it in all three games of this series so far. And now here is Andrew Jones leading off the second against Roy Oswald. All those years of promise for Andrew Jones and the highest he had ever finished in the MVP balloting, Steve, so far has been eighth. I think that's going to change pretty soon. <laughs> yes, it is.
Got some candidates for MVP in the National League. Derek Lee was huge. Of course, Andrew Jones and Albert Pujols, all three of these guys can stake a claim. Note the low batting average for Andrew Jones. I guess that's the only problem. Who's your MVP? I kind of like Andrew Jones. He just keeps getting hits when they matter, you know? I mean, you, you can look at some of the numbers and you can make a case for other guys. Uh, there's one of the few mistakes that Oswald has made so far. Wanted that ball away. This ball tails back out over the middle of the plate. Andrew doesn't miss too many of those. That is a picture-perfect swing with the wider stance now. Uses his hands much more effectively through the hitting zone. I mean, here are the Braves down 2 nothing, Steve, and the crowd really behind Roy Oswald. As LaRoche slashes one out of play, Jones gets behind one and two, steps up there, smacks it into left field. And now the Braves are in a position where a, a single swing here, either from Langer hands or Frank Hoare or this guy LaRoche, can tie this game 2-2. You're talking about the guy on first base right there that you're talking about is Andrew Jones. He's my MVP, too, just because of how he had to carry this ball club into the playoffs, nurture along the young players that they brought up. Now, no disrespect to those youngsters because there's a lot of teams that would bring four or five rookies up into a lineup, and they'd be nowhere near a playoff position. The Braves have been fortunate enough to bring up guys this year that could play at the major league level and get it done. But he put this team on his back, especially when Chipper Jones got hurt for six weeks. And you're right. They were running out just a conveyor belt of rookies every night. Jones gladly accepted that challenge. Off speed outside. It's funny. No matter how much Andrew Jones gives the Braves, the fans, the organization, they all want more. Even Terry Pendleton, the hitting coach for the Braves, I said, hey, pretty darn good year he had, didn't he? And you know what? TP looked at me and said, yeah, it was a pretty darn good year. Could have been great. <laughs> Inside, three and one. Terry Pendleton says he has to constantly work with Andrew about focus. He said with the number of runners on base that Jones saw this year, he could have easily had 150 RBIs. Had more runners in scoring position this year than any other player in the game. That's a balk. They're, yeah, they're, they're calling a balk. Oswald does not stop. He moves very quickly out there. He works quickly, but we'll see a replay of this. He will not pause at the bottom of his stretch. Got to come to... I don't know. It looked like a stop to me. You see anything there that looked bad? I mean, this is that's where his pause is at the top. I think they were looking for him to pause it at his belt, but he stops right at his chest. That's a stop right there. There's nothing wrong with that. You cannot argue a Bach call, but Phil Garner's going to come out and say, well, what was the problem? He just wants to know why. Well, meantime, LaRoche has been awarded first base. And that should not be parceled to the Bach. Well, we will effort to get an explanation. They're going to call it a ball to make LaRoche the runner at first. And Frank Kaur out in front. You've got two on and nobody out. And Roy Oswald is going to have to shrug this off. I'm sure he's still confused as to what exactly he just did. Well, you're right. I mean, if a balk would be a ball on a batter if there was nobody on base. If he's on base, the runner moves up. Well, here again, Oswald is ahead. He is 0-2 on Francourt. court. Ground ball, third base. There's one wide throw, a collision, and there's two. Now the high school football stud, Jeff Francoeur, went in there like a linebacker, didn't he? Yeah, and Lamb didn't move a bit. Lamb's a big kid himself. 
Francoeur was going to go to Clemson on a football scholarship as a cornerback. Lamb has a little bit of the advantage there because Francoeur isn't really looking to run him over, and Lamb's saying, just, I'm going to hold my ground and get you out of here. Now, maybe Francoeur would have been like Dion. He doesn't actually tackle anybody. <laughs> Langerhand will take down too low. The ironically named Mike Lamb. He hung right in there more like a lion. And the native Texan Langerhand now up in the count 2-0. Oh. Well, how about the job that Oswald is doing in this inning to get out of that jam? He's not even sure how he got into it in the first place. He is now 3-0 with Brian McCann on deck. And Atlanta fans know, I'm sure Houston fans remember too, what Brian McCann did with a couple men on base against Roger Clemens not too long ago. He will have a chance for some deja vu. You got two on, you got two out. You got an all-star pitcher on the mound. Brian McCann shrugged all of that off the other day. And he belted a home run that he'll be talking about for the rest of his life. Off the rocket, man. <laughs> he said it hadn't even sunk in. McCann at Francoeur. <laughs> He's getting some play. Such an effortless, pretty swing, too, on the Roger. Roger even conceded, hey, I bet the kid will remember that one for a while. <laughs> just kind of frisbeed up a curveball what the hey 0-1 said I've seen you hit a fastball a long way <laughs> let me see you hit this now back with the heat and three years out of high school here's Brian McCann in game three trying to get his Braves back into this game it is 2-0 Houston Curveball, fastball, curveball. And now what do you think on one and two? High fastball. Oswald likes to two-seam his fastball, but to run one up in the zone to get a guy to chase, he'll want to four-seam it to keep it more true and let that fastball ride. He doesn't want it to sink if that's where he goes. Blazed it in there at 97. It is poked in a left field, and McCann has done it again. This time with a bloop instead of a blast, it is two to one. The kids are all right. I'll tell you, this is, this is where, when you look at the Houston Astros, when they go with this lineup, their biggest deficiency defensively is Berkman in left field. You see how deep he's playing. He's not as comfortable out there. That's just a blooper in there. Of course, Berkman doesn't run all that well either. You see Everett going out as far as he can. He can't get it. And that ball just bled its way into left for a knock. Now the pitcher, Sosa, who, remember, was an outfielder for five years, almost six in the minors. And try to convince everyone he could swing the stick okay, but no, not in the majors anyway. 097. Yeah. That was one of the reasons why they made him a pitcher, <laughs> spent six years in the minor leagues, and they figured out he couldn't hit. Oswalt is facing the pitcher, an 0-97 hitter, and very uncharacteristically, he has slipped into a 2-0 count. Twenty two of those thirty four pitches here in this second inning. I got the visit from Mr. Settledown. Brad Osmus went out there 
And it's now two and one. That's just a great conversation and a good time to do it by Osmus. And say, look, this guy isn't going to hurt you. Throw the ball. Keep your concentration. Two walks and a balk. And a blue base hit. Nelson said he's still got to work. Try to go down and away right here. That ball is not a strike. Oswald was begging there a little bit. A base hit and a left by the pitcher. 2-2 two -two game here in Houston. Wow, this is... This really isn't the pitch that hurts Oswalt. It's the five pitches before that. He goes three and two on a guy that can't barely hit the ball out of the infield, and now he's got to throw a fastball right down Broadway, and he gets whacked. And Steve, I'll suggest to you what's bizarre about it is after the walk in the box, what seemed to be such an unsettling set of circumstances, he got that double play from Fran Cord, and it looked like smooth sailing. He had the bottom third of the order coming up, but he walked Langerhans gave up the blue pit to McCann and now the full count base hit to left by the pitcher throwing a two spot on the board nobody's hit the ball very hard at all in this inning top of the order Raphael for call Starts him with the curve, got the strike. What a transformation for Call has made this season. Everybody wondered about his ability to lead off because he had a lousy on-base percentage, never walks enough. Since July 1st, he's been a 333 hitter with a 402 on-base percentage. I'll take that for my leadoff guy any day. This happens to be a free agent at the end of the year. We talked earlier, Steve, about what a different pitcher Oswalt is when he's ahead in the count. Most pitchers are, but the stats with Roy Oswalt, I mean, the swing is just unbelievable. Got the ground ball on one and two, vacuumed up. Her call is out, but the Braves have tied it. They get two, and we're tied 2-2. Two -two. each other quite often in the postseason over the last decade or so it's the Braves and it's the Astros it is 2-2 as we get to the bottom of the second inning in game three Josh Lewin along with Steve Lyons and Chris Myers and Brad Osmus the veteran catcher leading off Osmus and the Astros manager Phil Garner together in Detroit several years ago Steve and Garner telling us before the game that even back then Osmus the kind of guy that just always wanted to be in there. Most catchers, down towards the end of a season, they start to wear down. This guy just wants to keep going. Over the last 10 years, no catcher in Major League Baseball has caught more games than Osmus has. I think the defining stat about Osmus is that in 18 pro seasons, Major League, Minor League, he has never once been on the DL. It's amazing. He's playing the position that beats you up the most. Guys, this one shallow center. Andrew Jones has got it. We're efforting it. Chris Myers to tell us what happened in that uh, very weird top of the second. What'd you get, Chris? Well, the bark that unraveled Roy Oswald. I just spoke with Jim McKeon, the uh, supervisor of umpires for Major League Baseball, who 
was here with Bob Watson. And he said it was very clear that it was a 3-1 pitch. So the balk automatically would advance the runner from first to second. But when he did pitch it, it was ball four. So that's why the batter was awarded first base. Now, if the player had hit the ball on that balk, it still would have been a live ball, and they would have completed the play. And in the actual balk call itself, he said the complete stop, they didn't see that. It wasn't complete. He said, I don't know if that word is in the rule book, but that's what we look for we call a balk. Uh, well. <laughs> I don't know, Jaws. I kind of disagree with the ruling. You either call a balk and then he doesn't throw the ball, or you let him throw the pitch and you don't call a balk. Why would you call a balk and then let the action continue and let him throw a pitch? It's almost like a continuation foul in basketball. Oswalt at the plate, and the count two and one to him. Jeff Nelson, the home plate umpire, was in the eye of the storm, so to speak, in game two. Had a lot to do at first base. Oswald serves it to right. Now well, Sosa got a hit off Oswald, but Oswald cannot return the favor. Gosh, let's revisit that Bach call and the ball four on the pitch. I want to see when Jeff Nelson comes out of his stance. Well, he was pointing as if to say, look, that's a Bach. And then Oswald threw the pitch anyway. Sometimes in this game, you're confused no matter what happens. <laughs> Biggio hammers it. It is his second double of the night already. You talked about it earlier, Steve. He gets up there in years. He has become a dead pull hitter, and he has pulled two into the corner. Of course, Biggio and Bagwell, such great friends. I asked Bagwell before this series started why Biggio had so many more home runs this year, a career high in home runs. I said, yeah, is he looking for opportunities? He's trying to maybe pick chances to juice the ball a little more, bit more, and Bagwell just laughed. He said, are you kidding me? He's a dead ball hitter. He just tries to hit balls up into that Crawford boxes all the time. Here's young Willie Tavares. They're guarding against the bunt. Yeah, I know, there's two outs. But they're guarding against the bunt. It's Willie Tavares. And 30 bunt hits this year. It's a weapon. Most managers don't like to see a guy bunt when you have someone in scoring pitches position at second base. Drive him in. Harmless sets in the center. And the Astros do not score. 2-2 two, two tie. End of two on Fox. The series is tied. Game three is tied here in Houston. Marcus Giles up there and takes strike one from Roy Oswald. The Braves are beneficiaries of some controversy in the top of the second inning. That walk and a balk. They chipped away. They got two runs. And now Roy Oswald has to deal with Giles and the two Joneses here in the third. Whoa. Uh -oh. Wow. Caught his cleat. Oswald on that delivery. Well, he's already balked once. Now on his delivery, watch. I think he catches his cleat right there and just. That front foot came down about six inches before he wanted it to come down, and he just took a header. Gonna trip on that shoelace, too. Ah, no big deal. 96 wow. miles an hour. See you later. I regrouped. Chipper Jones coming up. Let's go back to Chris Myers. All right, maybe Roy has settled down here. The official scorer here, Trey Wilkinson, wants to talk to the officials as well. He's paging through the rule book. It's a so-called balk for now. But again, Jim McKean, the head of uh, the officials here, supervisor, said that you call the balk, you can't call it the play to stop as well. If the batter had homered, the home run would have counted and there would have been no balk called. So maybe it was a delayed call on the balk and Oswald continued through the motion for that pitch which wound up being ball four. So you can talk the talk and walk the walk but I guess here in Houston the question is will you call the balk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's where I have trouble with this because if you're going to call a balk as an umpire you stop play. You're very emphatic about it. You call the balk 
The guy throws the pitch. If, if you brought this up during the break. If there's a 0-0 zero, zero count on the hitter and you call a balk and the pitcher goes ahead and throws the ball anyway, they call the balk, the, the runner moves to second base, and it's a no pitch. So why would it be any different in that situation? You Andrew. need to be emphatic about the balk call, stop the play, and not let anyone throw a pitch in that situation. I've never seen that before. Strike one to Andrew Jones. It, I mean, as it turns out, because it was ball four, you had two on anyway. Jones powers it to right center field. That ball takes off. It is high off the fence. Jones in at second base with a two-out double off Oswald. Well, watch this kid swing the bat. Goodness. Is that your MVP? That's my MVP. We talked about it earlier, all the reasons. I mean, the other two guys are absolutely deserving as well, but this Braves team got on this kid's back, and he carried them right to where they are right now, and that is just outstanding opposite field hitting. That's what's made Andrew Jones a much better power hitter this year is that he hits the ball to the opposite field much better than he has in his past. LaRoche bouncing one foul. Andrew Jones now, lifetime Steve, is 11 out of 20 against Roy Oswald. Came in hitting 500. <laughs> you know, for the viewers, I, I don't know that we want to just beat a dead horse with that box situation, but the fact is that's led to a couple runs in that inning. Left field for Berkman. That'll do it. Eight pitch inning. And it's still 2-2. Two -two. The Astros and the Braves tying it on in Houston somewhat literally. Right now the series is tied. This game is tied. Josh Lewin, along with Steve Lyons and Chris Myers, our entire Fox crew here in Houston. Jorge Sosa delivers to Berkman. Some oohs and ahs from this crowd here. Berkman does not get cheated. He hasn't been getting cheated in the postseason either. His postseason career, he's reached base safely in every game he's played except one. Sosa drops it onto the corner at 96. Oh, you're seeing some fastballs in this series. That was a nice try. Run that fastball outer half. Try to get Berkman to chase it. See that talked about the smoltz type slider that sosa has you might see that one right here yep and berkman a guy with an outstanding eye at the plate he's a guy that can chisel his way out of a one and two hole phil garner talking before the game telling us steve that they really don't have a lot of guys that can do what the braves do so well that's foul off pitches to get to either a better pitch to hit or to something like you just saw right there. Wait for Sosa to lift one up and out of the zone to make it two and two. Make the pitcher work a little bit, and especially in this series, it's much more important because everybody knows that the Braves' bullpen has struggled. Oh, that's flat and nasty right there, a slider. One down, bottom three. Let us check out our Verizon VCast series summary. Andy Pettit had the glove popping in game one. Morgan Ennisberg doing the heavy lifting with the five runs batted in. Then John Smoltz. How about John Smoltz in game two? Well, he was just phenomenal. Good fastball. Good breaking ball. Did not have a split finger. Ennisberg fouls it. Had a great conversation with Smoltz yesterday about his start. He said, you know, he was back in the clubhouse and he heard Jim Hickey the pitching coach of the Astros come on TV with us and say, Hickey said, I don't think he's using his split finger very often. And Smolsey said, darn, they know I'm not throwing it. He said his <laughs> fingers were hurt and he couldn't get a good grip on it. And he said, I can't believe they've already figured out that I'm not throwing that thing, but his slider was so devastating. He didn't need it. Ensberg on 0-2. Able to golf it in the center. Jones has got it. 
You know, we talk so much, Steve, about the kids with this Atlanta team, but you know what? The old guy has still got something, too. And look at that breaking ball, especially to Biggio. He had him all night swinging at it. That was a gutty performance up against a surefire Hall of Famer, no question, as is John Smoltz. Mike Lamb coming up. You know, 15 times this year, John Smoltz has been able to win a game after an Atlanta Braves loss. 15 and 2 after an Atlanta loss. Well, he went from being their closer to their stopper. He has authored a very cool story. A guy that was a dominating starter, then a dominating closer, back to a dominating starter. Next stop, Cooperstown. Well, you talk about only two players in the history of Major League Baseball to have more than 150 wins and 150 saves. Dennis Eckersley being the other one. John Smoltz. The only two guys to do it. Mike Lamb drives it right field. There it goes. location in that area goodness you're looking for big big trouble look at the concentration in the eyes little bit out in front watch the balance on lamb he's got him just a tad out in front but that's getting that bad head out and pulling a pitch that was like middle in Whew. one oh pitch now to jason lane make it two and oh and you know, a couple things there steve sosa had allowed only one home run in 38 innings before that at bat. Mike Lamb is a guy that had not played at all in this series until tonight. Bill Garner said he had a good feeling. Lamb had been swinging the bat well in September, wanted to let him be in the lineup tonight. Uh, there's a swing from the other side. Nice short stride. Got the bat head out in front of the strike zone there and pulled that ball into the seats. It's funny that he told you he had a feeling about Lamb. When I asked him about the switch, he looked at me and said, we're panicking. <laughs> Just joking, of course. A bobble. The recovery by Jones, and the inning is over. The first round out all night for Sosa. This ball was a fly ball, and it went. The Division Series on Fox, sponsored by VCAS from Verizon Wireless. It's broadband quality video on your phone. By Monster.com. Don't miss another opportunity. Post your resume today. By the personal advisors of Ameriprise Financial. And by Chevy. Chevy and baseball, they just go together. An American revolution. Jeff Francoeur, first pitch swinging, drives it near the pole. And it is barely fouled. Welcome back to Houston. We're in the top of the fourth. It is 3-2 Astros, and that almost just changed. Well, Frank Kerr went 131 at-bats before his first walk. It wouldn't surprise anybody that's hacking at that first pitch. Jumping all over a high fastball, trying to keep it fair, just hooking at the last minute. Now the curveball, down he goes. I tell you, that is a nasty curveball. And we talk about the difference in speed. But Frank Cura almost does a pretty good job of hanging with this. He gets out front a little bit, makes an adjustment in his swing, then can't quite come up with it. And that's one of the better swings we've seen at an Oswald breaking pitch. Another one of the kids, Ryan Langerham, back home in Texas. This is the inning, Steve, where both Frank Cura and McCann bat. They are both... 21, Langer hands is 25. We asked the question, how young is young? And if you remember Michael Jackson's Thriller video, well, Francoeur and McCann do not. They were not born yet when it debuted. Francoeur wasn't born when Roger Clemens made his debut. Faced him the other day in a game.
Owens Walt in there. Two strikeouts here in the fourth inning. The Astros love the fact that Oswalt works very, very quickly, worked so quickly, worked himself into a balk in the second inning, but he gets the ball and throws it. Sosa does pretty much the same for the Braves. These guys keep it moving, keep your defense on their toes. Here's the other 21-year-old, Brian McCann. I got to think in that game against Clemens where he hit the three-run homer, he was may have been taking some hitting advice from his brother Brad. His older brother Brad plays in the Marlins organization. He was the player of the year in the minor leagues for them this year with 29 home runs. McCann had five all season. I think maybe his brother was telling him, hey, here's what you got to do. You could almost hear Brian's spine tingling when he hit that home run off the rocket man. Took a fastball over the wall and into posterity off of Clemens. The youngest catcher ever to homer in a postseason game. And Clemens ended up allowing five earned runs Thursday night. That ball fired out of play, one and two. You see that pitch before that. I don't know if McCann was ready for it. If Oswald got moving before McCann was ready. Almost a quick pitch, wasn't it? That's how quickly Oswald works. Well, he is varying his rhythm out there. He is certainly varying, as you said he would see, varying that pitch speed. We have seen 96 miles an hour with the fastball in this inning. That curveball was 68 funny too you talk to a lot of the people around the Astros and I think Oswald just doesn't feel like he needs a lot of pitches but he has a very good changeup just rarely rarely uses it and you see the pitch count <laughs> 68 miles an hour and you look at what Oswald's doing he got a strikeout his first of the game in the third he's got two in this inning don't let him settle in Now the fastball. Oswalt out of the inning. It stays 3-2 Houston on Fox. Astros are leading game three by the score of 3-2. And it is Adam Everett to lead things off. Bottom four. He takes up an in. A little bit of an icy patch to navigate for Jorge Sosa. In the very first inning, he gave up two runs. There's a little bit of ice forming right now. There's a leadoff hit achieved by Everett. Adam Everett can be a very dangerous hitter in the back half of this lineup. Had a career high in home runs this year. This one not out of the ballpark. Picture perfect swing. On another fastball. I don't think that... Sosa has the great feel of his breaking pitch today, and he's throwing a lot more fastballs than he wants to. He has, break, he has broke out that breaking pitch occasionally, but not as consistently tonight. Brad Ausmus, the batter, a guy who was prone to bang into some double plays. And Everett has run a little bit this year. In fact, a career high in steals. Osmus hit 330 versus Atlanta in the postseason last year. Never been known much for his bat. Hit below 260 this year, but since July 1st, hit nearly 290. Now we talked about it. Osmus, an unusual player in that historically most catchers wear down as the season goes along. Most of them wear down as their careers go along. There are those numbers. After June 30th, everything went sky high for him. I think the biggest thing he does, Steve, is he keeps the Astros cool and loose. He arrived at Houston's clubhouse before the critical game five of the NLCS last year, skateboarding. 
Martin wearing a pair of flip-flop sandals on a skateboard. Ironically, the smartest guy on the team, <laughs> Dartmouth grad. Did that differently, too. Played minor league baseball, went to Dartmouth in the offseason. Said, I did it that way, so I never really had to go home. <laughs> One and two, the count. Don't all econ majors at Dartmouth go class to class on a skateboard and flip-flops, or not really? Sure. Big time surfer in the offseason. Southern California. He and Innsberg spent a lot of the offseason surfing the California coast. Knocked away foul. You know, for what it's worth, Bill Gardner's fear about the Astros not being able to foul pitches away to get better pitches. Maybe unfounded tonight. The Astros with 15 foul balls. That's about twice as many as the Braves tonight. And 60 pitches almost now. 59 pitches for Sosa, as we mentioned before. The reason he throws too many pitches, he only goes five or six innings, and then you get into that Atlanta pen that's been very shaky. Trying to foul it to get a better pitch, but he fouls out instead to Adam LaRoche. That always sounds odd, doesn't it? Trying to foul it, but with two strikes on you, you've got to protect on that outside pitch, right? Yeah, generally it's a, it's a pitch that's nasty. You don't think you can do anything with it, so you're trying to just get a piece of it. Now, I was never good enough to do that. <laughs> Watch LaRoche come over here to make the play, and, and that guy's saying, ah, everybody stay back. He didn't want to become a Bartman. Oswalt, the pitcher, able to take down an outside. Oswalt's got to try to make sure he bunts this ball to the right-hand side over here. You'll see Chipper Jones as the play develops. He will be crashing. He'll end up right here. Oswalt makes a mistake and bunts it towards Chipper. He'll go to second with the ball. Back to the mound, and Sosa's got it. They turn the double play. Well, Oswald actually made some pretty decent contact, but it's the inning-ending double play in Houston. Pitcher to pitcher, as we get going in the fifth inning, we are in game three of the National League Division Series, Houston and Atlanta. The series tied at one. Oswald and Sosa. Both men with ERAs of around three. Oswald with 20 wins. Sosa with 13 wins. But a guy I think, Steve, that still thinks he can swing the stick. Remember, he was an outfielder in the minors for a while. Got a base hit in his first step back. As you mentioned, during the regular season, did not swing the bat very well. He looks like a hitter up there. They don't forget that quickly. No, the other Sosa tends to hit him a little farther. Yeah. Jorge Sosa down on strikes. Moments ago, we talked with Roy Oswalt's pitching coach, Jim Hickey, and asked him about that weird set of circumstances with the balk call in the second. Well, the, the balk was that, uh, I believe it was, that he didn't stop, uh, which is kind of an unusual call. He does the same thing kind of over and over time and again, and uh, sometimes he's on the edge. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, obviously to uh, Jeff behind the plate, he went a little bit uh, too quick that time, but... You know, he really ran into trouble as he was going to the far side of the plate and the fastball leaked back over the plate a little bit. Andrew Jones, that happened. McCann, that happened as he popped the ball in the left field. So, um, you know, the balk was a factor, but uh, it, might have, it might have taken him off his game a little bit, but uh, there was a little bit more control of the fastball. Jim, overall, though, he's starting to settle down. Three strikeouts in the last two innings. How is he looking to you now? Well, now he's looking pretty good to me. He came out that next inning, struck Giles out on a fastball away that stayed straight and true out to the outside corner. Uh, he's keeping the ball down a little bit better. Uh, so right now I'm in, I'm, I'm pretty uh, I'm, I'm in high spirits right now for him. All right, Jim, thank you very much. All right, thanks for having me. I don't want to see Jim Hickey when he's not in high spirits. See? <laughs> <laughs> Here's Giles and a big rip for strike one after the call fly out deep to left center. Guy's about as calm as they come, isn't he? Still looking for him on your local FM Jazz channel. He does have that lilting voice, doesn't he? Sounds nope. good. He's got to go out there and settle down a pitcher. The 
into the right field stands on a foul. This day in Major League Baseball history, October 8, back in 1939, top of the 10th, Ernie Lombardi plowed over, left dizzy by King Kong, Charlie Keller, allowing Joe DiMaggio to come all the way in. World Series moments, America's beer saluting America's pastime. Budweiser, proud sponsor of Major League Baseball. For more info, log on to foxsports.com on MSN. Keyword, Budweiser. Especially with two strikes here, Giles is going to try to drive the ball into right center field. He's an excellent opposite field hitter. Trying to go that way, but he fouls it. Talked about it a little bit in game two of this series. Giles and Derek Jeter of the Yankees. Two guys that I see, especially in the game of baseball, that consistently try to go the other way, regardless of the situation. Walt out of the inning. 3-2. Houston on top, 3-2. We go to the bottom of the fifth with the top of the order up for the Astros. Craig Vigio gets it going. And boy, has he done that in this game with a pair of doubles in the left field corner. Craig Vigio with the new and improved stance. Doesn't have that big leg kick anymore. Tried to perfect that over the last two seasons. Most guys add a leg kick to gain power. He got rid of his and had a career high in home runs this year with 26. I asked him why. He said, you know what? Physically, I just couldn't do it anymore. I had this big, huge leg kick for 600 at-bats every year. Got too tough to do. Pops it up on the right side. LaRoche grabs it. So now Biggio, two out of three. Folks, tomorrow on Fox NFL Sunday, we'll take a closer look at Eagles quarterback Donovan McNabb as he plays through pain. Giant star Michael Strahan will be in the studio to discuss New York's strong start. Plus, Brian Urlacher going 10 yards with TB. Fox NFL Sunday, tomorrow at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. You will see it here on Fox. Right now, you're seeing a possible Rookie of the Year. Willie Tavares taking strike one. Well, I asked you who your MVP was. Who's your Rookie of the Year? You want me to say Tavares, don't you? I want you to say who you think is. I am not going to say Tavares. Ryan Howard? No. Jeff Francoeur? Yes. All good choices. Ryan Howard has the sexy numbers with the 22 home runs. Francoeur just came in and... Turned the baseball world upside down, hitting close to 380 and the 13 outfield assist. I think the ladies will take issue with you that anybody is sexier than Jeff Rancourt, but <laughs> <laughs> Willie Tavares is putting up some decent numbers. Well, look at the ranks for his rookie performance, and I like the fact that he did it all year long. Replaced a guy who had the greatest postseason <laughs> last year. In, in the history of the game. Three great choices can't go wrong. And a 2-2, bang near third, it's fair! And it pinballs Tavares easily into second base. He's got a one-out double. Boy, it has been a parade of doubles against Sosa. He has given up two to Biggio, one to Ensberg, and now this chopper by Tavares. Uh, when you're a player like Tavares, you love to see a ball hug a foul line because you know you're going for two. And if it gets misplayed or mishandled, you may be thinking about going three. Right now, he's thinking of the possibility of going past second base to third. Now he holds up when everybody handles the ball nicely. Standing there with a double. Lance Berkman hit by a pitch in the first, and he scored a run. The 
one out in this situation. Lance Berkman looking to drive the ball anywhere. Doesn't necessarily have to pull the ball to the right field. In fact, he is a better hitter when he's thinking into the left center field gap, especially when he's hitting left-handed. Take the ball away from him and hit it right over for Call's head. Getting behind the catcher. Tavares didn't see it, though. And with his speed, it would have been easy pickings over there at third. But he was screened by everybody there at home plate. Well, this is the toughest one to judge as a runner. You see it right there. You don't see the ball go behind him. He didn't know it was behind him until right now. And then it's too late to go anywhere. See, he just figured McCann blocked that ball. We could tell the same view that he had. And we couldn't tell, really, that the ball had skipped behind him until he stood up to go back there and get it. Rip, he didn't get it. That's a good high tailing fastball. That's the tough one for a left-hander to get up on top of. Watch Berkman swing underneath this pitch. This is the part of the order, Steve, where the Astros can still hurt you a little bit. Berkman and Ensberg. This year's Astros scored 110 fewer runs than last year's Astros. They said goodbye to Beltron. They said goodbye to Kent. And three and four in the order now. Berkman and Ensberg. They were further down in the order last year. Can you imagine if they had last year's hitting and this year's pitching? <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> and Ensberg certainly stepped it up a notch. 26 more home runs this year than last year. He battled hand and back injuries last year. He changed his stance, standing much more straight up this year than he was last year. That 26 more home runs this year than last was more than any other player in the big leagues. Second on that list, of course, Andrew Jones, who hit 22 more home runs this year than he hit the previous season. Hensburg is an absolute delight to talk to. Wide-eyed, has a lot of fun. I asked him, what's the main difference in your production this year over last year? He said, I swing as hard as I can every time. Except that time. Well, <laughs> well, you know, he's always prided himself, Steve, on solving problems. Last year it was. The lack of power that was a problem, and he attacked it at its choke point. Densberg tells of his maternal grandfather, who literally was a rocket scientist. He helped test the space shuttle for that, <laughs> identified problems, fixing them. And now in the home of NASA, of all places, Densberg, tweaking his swing with that scientific precision. A nice job by McCann right there to keep that ball in front of him. This is a kid, McCann, who they love behind the plate. He's very quiet back there. He's become Smoltz's personal catcher. That ball in the dirt, picture perfect blocking it. He was a high school infielder. He was smart enough to realize while watching Frank Coor play <laughs> against him in high school, he said, I am never getting drafted as a second baseman. I better go try to learn how to catch. And he has been outstanding back there. Smoltz fell in love with pitching to him. Become his personal catcher now. Looking to drive the ball, you say. He drills it, but to a very deep part of the yard. And the inning is over. Andrew Jones is coming in to hit. So is Chipper Jones. It is a 3-2 game. Houston on top. The Division Series on Fox, sponsored by Chevy. Chevy and baseball, they just go together in American Revolution. This is the fifth time in nine years the Braves have opened the playoffs with a Division Series date against Houston. Chipper Jones has been there for all of that. And boy, what a nice running play Andrew Jones made to close that last half inning, Steve. It is a 3-2 lead for Houston.
Andrew Jones getting a lot of attention this year. But don't forget about Chipper. Nine division series home runs, which is a record, but it should be noted that the division round has only existed for 10 years. Jones, the only position player to be in a National League division series each of those 10 years. That helps you. Not here, not against Oswald. Wow, that was... He just got abused right there by Oswald. That's all you can say about it. That's an outstanding hitter seeing four pitches. Watch the first pitch, sinking fastball outside, corner unhittable. Next pitch, little backdoor cutter. Then he goes slider down and in. Then he goes right back to the outer half again. Chipper has no chance. Wow. What a mighty rip at that one from Andrew Jones and a cue shot foul ball. Oh, what a play he made to end that fifth inning. Watch this. This is the relation. There's the hitter. Now, now what I want you to watch is as soon as he swings the bat, how quickly you see Andrew Jones' back already turning and running not looking at the ball he knows where it's going to come down that is a tremendous defensive play and a great jump oh you don't get seven gold gloves at the local convenience store you got earned <laughs> <laughs> so i got mine <laughs> what's the line you got your gold glove with a can of spray paint <laughs> <laughs> oh and two the fans firmly behind roy oswald Well, you got to love the way Oswald is thinking, how he's setting hitters up now, really has settled down. Just saw the at-bat to Chipper Jones, going right after Andrew the same way. Andrew, two for two against him tonight. And again, we remind you, 11 of 20 lifetime. Let's check out how he worked Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones went up there the first pitch looking to go for the downs on the first uh, curveball that he saw. Then one down in the dirt. Then the high fastball trying to put him away. And he goes back to the breaking ball and gets him anyway. Jones out in front, out on his front foot. We've seen Oswald throw quite a few more sliders now later in the game. Little looper. And a base hit for LaRoche. Which will stem the tide a little bit. Get Jeff Rancourt to the plate. Even that pitch, Josh, is a, a fastball in on the hands of LaRoche, just fighting it off. Jam shot. Adam will take him any way he can get him. But the point I think about Oswald, Steve, and you hit on it, when he's on, I mean, he's on. There was a game before the All-Star break last year. He threw 25 strikes in a row. <laughs> I mean, nobody does that. Clemens doesn't do that. We have breaking news here. Jeff Frank so quickly. Jeff Francoeur took a pitch. The Braves might have to start thinking about breaking his rhythm, stepping out of the box now and then. Oswald gets the ball, and within seconds, he's ready to throw it again. There's Frank Corr stepping out, readjusting his gloves, maybe trying to break the rhythm a little bit. You cannot let this guy settle in the way he has lately. Ooh. The home plate umpire, Jeff Nelson, flinched, didn't call it. Roy Oswald wants to know where, what, high? This jelly-like Frank Corr up there. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a little bit up. We saw almost exclusively fastball curveballs early in the game. Now into the sixth. Seeing quite a bit more sliders. That one in and got him. Uh, that's about a 95 mile an hour fastball in off mm. of his hands. Fran Coor ducks down a little bit, but then watch him. He's like a $6 million man all of a sudden. He acted like a mosquito landed on him or something. That has got to hurt. 
And that is a guy, not only for his hitting and his defense, Steve, but for his raw energy that the Braves absolutely need in their lineup. They got him right off the back of the left hand, it looks like. A lot of little bones back in there that can really do some damage to you if you get hit. He's acting like he just took a ball four. Well, Brancourt, the biggest thing maybe to blow into Atlanta since Michael Vick. And with Brancourt, Steve, he's got the added attraction of being a local guy. You talked about it, growing up in Atlanta, going to Braves games. The first one he went to, he says, was the one where Bob Horner hit the four home runs. He was seven when the Braves won the NLCS in 1991. He's now 21 years old. They're still in the playoffs every year. It was a, an amazing run. John Sherholtz, Bobby Cox, and the rest of the organization here for the Braves. They take a lot of heat about having won only one world championship in those 14 years. Langerhand takes the curveball for a strike. Chipper Jones said, we won it in 95. The one year where we feel like we should have won it and didn't was 96 against the Yankees. And the rest of the years, we kind of bumped into a team that was playing better than us or a better club than us. No shame in that. And the nucleus is now down to John Smoltz and the Joneses. And heading into the season, that really seemed like a bad thing. But this infusion of new talent has everyone in Atlanta talking in LCS. But they got to get by Houston. Now the fans are letting a home plate umpire, Jeff Nelson, hear it a bit here. Nelson called a tight but fair game in the ALCS when he had the plate last year. Pedro Martinez, he called Pedro for four walks. Right field, no sweat. Getting over. 3-2, Houston in game three. You're looking at the difference in the game. That is Mike Lamb. His solo homer in the third. That is why it is 3-2 Houston. This is game three of the NLDS. Josh Lewin with Steve Lyons and Chris Myers here at Minute Maid Park in Houston. Now Lamb trying left field instead of right field. Not quite enough. Lamb who came over from the Yankees and we look at the Yankees and the Angels. You will look at the Yankees and the Angels. The subway pitching matchup. Game four of the ALDS in New York will be here on Fox tomorrow night, 7.30 Eastern. Now, it's supposed to have been a game four today, but all kinds of wet weather back east. Wash burn, washed out. That ball raked in a left field. Jason Lane bidding for another Houston double. And he's got it. Jason Lane looking dead red, first pitch fastball. Look at the concentration and the eyes right down on the baseball. Hit it down into that left field corner. Boy, Lane finally getting a chance to make an impact. The major league level hit 26 homers and 78 RBIs this year. Here's Adam Everett. And Adam Everett with a fly ball left center. Andrew Jones has the range. Uh, a little while ago, we talked with Tim Hudson and talking about what he sees from Jorge Sosa tonight. Well, he's looking good, you know. He's, uh, you know. he's made a couple pitches that he probably wish he got back, but, you know, for the most part, man, he's going out there and, uh, you know, found the strike zone. You know, they put some pretty good at-bats on him, but, um, you know, still a close game. we got a lot of baseball left, and hope we can go out there and uh, stretch out a few more runs. Huddy, if you get the opportunity to take the ball again in this series, what adjustments will we see out of you? Well, I'm just going to uh, just relax and, and uh, you know, stay back a little bit. You know, just rushing, rushing the plate. And, uh, you know, I just got to gotta calm and settle down a little bit and, and stay back and uh, just trust my stuff. Thanks, Tim. You got it, guys. 
All right, so here's the big question. Is Sosa's going to put on Osmus to get to Oswald? Does Tim Hudson pitch tomorrow? I think he does. I, I, you know, I think they have been very kind of secretive about it. Bobby Cox not wanting to mention who his game four starter is going to be, but I had talked to him before game two, and Bobby Cox is kind of a jugular type of guy. If you go up in the series, throw Hudson out there just to nail it down. If you go down in the series 2-1, Tim Hudson definitely, in my opinion, takes the ball. I say either way, give it to him. Bobby Cox hasn't done a lot wrong this year. A tour de force managerial performance, breaking in 17 rookies, letting the kids go a little nutty, sculpting a 14th consecutive division title. Right now, he wants Sosa to face the pitcher, Roy Oswald. You know, Josh, historically, pitchers don't do all that well on three days rest, but Hudson pitched in the playoffs last year on three days rest. He did it once earlier this season. Hudson relies on the sinker and the changeup. A lot of sinker-type pitchers don't mind being a little bit more tired, just puts more sink on their ball. Comebacker. And the Astros will strand the couple. It is a 3-2 game at the end of six. We'll come back to Houston after a word from your local Fox station. we go to the back third of the ball game in game three of the National League Division Series here in Houston. The series tied 1-1. Brian McCann had the big three run a homer off the rocket man in game two. Jorge Sosa, 90 pitches could be done. And Brian McCann down on the count 0-1. Roy Oswald now up around 90 pitches too. And boy, this crowd has really rallied behind Roy Oswald tonight. You look at the line on Sosa. Oswald's got seven strikeouts, and right here he's got a fly ball to left for the first out of the seventh inning. Now, Kelly Johnson is going to hit now. So, yeah, Leo Mazzoni is telling Jorge Sosa, good job, you're done. Uh, he did a nice job, too. He came into this situation where he had never been in a playoff game before. We talked about how tough it can be to pitch in this stadium, not only the dimensions of the field, but also the crowd and the noise. 9-0 on the road this year. They did a pretty darn nice job. Now another native Texan coming home, Kelly Johnson out of Austin. Won a hopper, juggled, and Vigio's got him anyway. Folks, tomorrow, a Fox NFL Sunday doubleheader, beginning with the unbeaten, yes, unbeaten, Tampa Bay Bucks. They will invade New York to take on the Jets. Then T.O. and the Eagles, renewing the rivalry with Drew Bledsoe and the Cowboys. Both teams trying to keep pace for other regional action. It begins with America's number one pregame show. at tomorrow at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific on Fox. My Roy Oswald. Up at 94 pitches right now, but two outs in this inning. He's thrown just three. Facing for call. And Steve, we've talked about it. Pettit and Clemens, they get a lot of ink. They get a lot of attention, rightly so. Don't forget Roy Oswald. I know the Atlanta Braves won't anytime soon. And again, Oswald hangs his head as if to defy the call from a home plate umpire, Jeff Nelson. Osmus out again for a little settle down session. Doesn't want Oswald to get emotional about what he's perceiving. And I think Nelson's done an outstanding job behind the plate today. He's been very consistent. If you look at the kind of numbers that Oswald threw out there this year. That's consistent. Wow. His college pitching coach, Steve, says they'd have to kick him off the field at night because he'd be out there playing long toss, even in the rain. 23rd round pick of the Astros out of junior college. Did a pretty daring thing. He didn't sign his contract. He went back to school figuring if I get better. Well, the Astros either have to pony up to get me to sign or maybe someone else drafts me instead. First game of sophomore year, one scout in attendance to watch him pitch. Steve, by his last game, there were 37. 
And the Astros, who still had his wife, said, tell you what, we'll give you half a mil not to let those scouts recommend you to their bosses. We'll sign you right now. Pretty good call. Little squibber. Osmus has got it. And here in game three, Oswald and the Astros still in control. 3-2. The Division Series on Fox, sponsored by Sprint Business. Sprint Business, yes, you can. By Charles Schwab. Get premium service without the premium price. Talk to Chuck. By Subway Restaurants. Subway, eat fresh. And by Nissan, who reminds you to shift the way you move through the world. Traffic moving fine in Houston. And the Astros have moved in front 3-2. They've had that lead since the third inning. Game three, with game four set for tomorrow afternoon. Josh Lewin with Steve Lyons and Chris Myers. This was a 2-2 game into the bottom of the third. Mike Lamb's home run made it a 3-2 score, and that's where we are right now. The Braves making a pitching change. Chris Rietzma into action. Rietzma's already seen a lot of action in this postseason. You look at his regular season numbers. Another outstanding season. He's had a tough time getting outs in the postseason. Nobody's really been hitting the ball hard against him. He's been giving up a lot of hits, a lot of runs. He's got an excellent changeup. Yeah, last year against Houston, in the deciding game five, he was dinged up four runs in a third of an inning. This year, game one again, a third of an inning, four runs. Last year, there was a big Jeff Bagwell home run among the carnage. This year, it was simply a series of soft singles. Leitz was the guy who's broken his arm three different times. First time when he was 19 years old. Then got hit on the arm and broke it. And then had complications again later. Still come back to be very effective. Craig Vigio up in the count one and oh. Talked about the leg kick of Craig Biggio and the difference in his swing over two seasons ago. Watch how violent the leg kick is on the left. He said it's just too hard to keep doing that. He said the toughest part now is to not move his top half with him. Does a great job right there keeping his top half back, leading with his legs. You know what, though? He could go up there and bat left-handed. <laughs> and the fans here would still love him. Uh, I'll tell you what, you know, he, he talked a lot about the fact that without the leg kick, that was kind of his timing mechanism. His, the timing mechanism for his timing of when to start moving towards the pitch. Moves into that one, cranks another one to left. The third double of the game for Biggio. We're going to take a good look at that swing without the leg kick. Watch how he keeps his top half back. That's just an outstanding balance right there. He was worried about getting his top half out in front without that big leg kick to help him keep his timing right. Picture perfect. Three doubles. All down the left field line. <laughs> Later tonight, game three of the National League Division Series between the Cardinals and Padres. That'll be on ESPN 11 Eastern. Willie Tavares. Tavares has one of the Houston doubles tonight, Steve. Six Houston doubles, a new record for National League Division Series play. There's the bunt popped up. And the belly flop for McCann, he came up empty. Well, Tavares once again trying to drag his way on here in a sacrifice situation. And then McCann, go get it. But you want Tavares just to, to kind of nudge one in play here, right? Just get that runner to third. I don't mind so much in that situation, but if he's asked to bunt again now with the one strike, he's got to give himself up. Square around, drop the bunt down. It's called a sacrifice. That's a drag bunt. 
Tavares, remember, 30 bunt base hits this year. So you can, I guess, understand a little bit if there's a greed factor here. He has done this for base hits before. But when you're in a sacrifice situation, as he has now been twice in this game and not done the job twice in this game, you got to square around and drop it down. Get Biggio to third base. Loops it right near that dugout. It stays one and two. The first inning when Biggio led off with a double, he was asked to bunt then, didn't get it done, and ended up striking out. Didn't move the runner over. You got Berkman and Ensberg and Lamb coming up behind you to try to drive in that run. It's a lot easier to do it from third base. Got it done. Yes, he did. And again with Reitzma. He runs into some issues against Houston in the playoffs. And again, it's the soft stuff. He's not getting blasted. He's not giving up home runs. That is an infield hit for Tavares. Another infield hit. We talked about it. 70 of them on the season. The kid can fly. Well, you got to give him some credit. I jumped on him a little bit when he didn't get the bunt down, and now he came through, got a hit, and got the guy over anyway. Bobby Cox will make a pitching change with Berkman coming up. You may ask yourself, how did we get here? Well, the Houston Astros with a two-run first inning. Ensberg, the big hit. Bottom of the order coming through for Atlanta in the second. McCann and the pitcher, Jorge Sosa. 2-2 two -two tie until Mike Lamb went yard. 3-2 Astros in game three. The Nissan game summary. Sosa and Oswald, the two starters. Sosa's gone. We'll tell you about the new pitcher in just a moment. See, the Astros have doubled their pleasure tonight a half a dozen two base hits. And now the Atlanta Braves are really in a spot here. They are down 3-2, bottom seven, and the ultimate situational guy comes in, John Foster, the lefty, to turn around Lance Berkman. First and third and nobody out. Base hit left field. 4-2. Berkman gets turned around to the right side. Not as much power, but just as good a hitter. He hit 290 from the right side, but just three of his 24 home runs came from that side. He doesn't care. He doesn't need the big fly right here. Picks out the first pitch, bangs it into left field, and scores a run. That will be the first, last, and only act in this game for Foster. One pitch, and goodbye. Morgan Ensberg coming up. It is now 4-2 Houston. The so-called baby Braves continue to get their collective feet wet. Here is Joey Devine, who in June, Steve, <laughs> was in college. And here he is in the NLDS. First round draft choice this year of these Atlanta Braves. He inherits a two-on, nobody-out situation. Ensberg taking ball one. Well, this is a lot better than what he usually inherits. <laughs> His first two appearances, he gave up grand slams. First major leaguer ever to do that. Paints the corner, one and one. That was a fastball at about 87 miles an hour, about 8 to 10 miles an hour faster than, or slower than he's advertised. You can run the ball up mid-90s. It was a little slider as well, mostly fastballs though. What a spot to put a 22-year-old kid in. Brad Lidge, remember, is a closer for Houston. In theory, if this game favors Houston after eight, it, you know, a lot of people figure it's over. Got to keep it close here if you're Joey Devine. But Ensberg to left. Will drop it in the corner. Safe at third, another Houston double.
think this was a mislocation, Josh. I think he was trying to go away from Ensberg, see where they're set up. That's a look like a little cut fastball that just hangs out over the middle of the plate. Ensberg out in front of it a little bit. He has been out in front of a lot of the pitches that he's swung at today, but still been very successful whacking the ball around the yard. Seven doubles for the Houston Astros. They're not even through seven innings, and they will go ahead and walk Lamb to get to Lane. And you've already discussed what's happened Grand Slam-wise in the brief Major League career of Joey Devine. Well, he gave up a Grand Slam in his very first appearance, came back in his next one, gave up another one. In game one of this series, Orlando Palmero came up with the bases loaded, and he hit it deep to the right field wall in Atlanta. All Atlanta fans held a collective breath as the ball was caught. <laughs> but here we go again. Wow, this Braves bullpen has been their Achilles heel all season long, and it's not getting any better. Infield is in. Bases loaded, nobody out for lane. Pitch down on the knees. If you're laying, you're saying, whoo, give me a chance. Spooned in the air, right side. The fans wishing it out of play, and they get their wish. Well, the Yankees and Angels rained out today. Game four goes tomorrow on Fox. Don't forget ESPN and ESPN2 will help you out to see the Braves and Astros game four. Cardinals and Padres actually playing game four tomorrow. Game three will be tonight. Blocked by McCann. It is still a 5-2 game. The base is still loaded here. And still nobody out. Jason Lane with the career homer. 26 home runs this year, his career high. 2001 in the minor leagues right here in Round Rock. Hit 38 homers and had 124 RBIs. They expect a lot of power out of him as his career moves along. Into left. Six to two. for call is about 5-6. He catches this ball. Gets up as high as he can. Just can't quite snag it. Six men have batted it here in the seventh. Six men have reached. It is 6-2 Houston. Oh, the Braves desperate for an out here in the bottom of the seventh. They will turn to their fourth reliever of the inning. That is Jim Brower. And Steve, all the happy talk about the Braves' young players. And it has been a great story this year, but it, it strikes you as just a lot of empty yada yada if this bullpen keeps doing this. That's been their problem all season long. They just haven't been able to get anybody out. Everett skies one. Out of play. We talked about the fact that Sosa generally throws a lot of pitches in his starts and can't get past the sixth inning and that puts the ball into the hands of the bullpen and that has spelled trouble all season for them. The Braves 12th in the National League in bullpen ERA as you probably heard by now. 
Kick swing foul by Everett. More than that, Steve, there were three games under 500. And note that only one playoff team of the last 80 playoff teams has made it to a World Series with a losing record from its bullpen. That was the 0-3 Yankees, who never got to use that bullpen much against the Marlins. Everett on coils. Andrew Jones fading back. Runners tagging from second and from third. It is a four-run seventh inning. Mercifully, the first out of the seventh inning. You know, Josh, this might be a little thing, but this ball's hit deep to center field. Jones doesn't try to go to third. Lane was tagging up from first on that play. He goes hard into second to keep the double play in order and to keep his team somewhat in this game. The veteran catcher, Brad Osman, has had the pleasure of catching Roy Oswald tonight. just heaved that heavy sigh. I think he speaks for a lot of Atlanta fans right now. This is some kind of inning. Four runs in. Browery remembers the guy who pitched in San Francisco. They released him. Picked up by the Braves. Spent some time in Richmond. Got 30 innings in, in the, big, the big league level here for the Braves. Did a nice job for them. One ball, one strike. Austin didn't like the call. Another reminder tonight, a little bit later, game three of the other National League Division Series, Cardinals and Padres from San Diego. That game will be on ESPN starting at 11 Eastern. This one was a snug 3-2 game into the bottom of the seventh inning. is chasing. Fifth time in nine years it's been the Braves and the Astros in the division series. And in the last two now, last year and this year, Houston took game one, Atlanta took game two. Tapper right side. They get one out there. Fire back. Got him. Double play. Acrobatically so, and Brad Ausmus is hot. He'll argue the call. Time for our sprint game break. We go to Jeannie's Alaska. Welcome to the sprint game break. Your great sports weekend continues with the NFL on Fox. J.B., Terry, Howie, and Jimmy will take a closer look at Eagles quarterback Donovan McNabb. And Giant star Michael Strahan will be in studio. The Fox NFL Sunday doubleheader begins tomorrow. Noon Eastern, 9 Pacific. Rain forced the postponement of game four of the ALDS for the Angels and Yankees. They will meet tomorrow night on Fox. New York facing elimination, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. For more information on the Sprint Game Break, log on to foxsports.com, keyword poll. This has been the Sprint Game Break. Brad Ausmus ruled out at first base. That inning finally ended with four runs in. Roy Oswald back to work here in the eighth. Marcus Giles at the plate would take you back to that inning-ending play. Pretty good play by Brower there. His foot stays on the bag, and he's out by a smidgen on an absolute bullet thrown by Fertal on the relay play to first base. Meantime, Oswald up around 100 pitches now and not exactly showing any signs of breaking down. Now, the worst thing that may have happened to him so far this game is sitting in the dugout that long as his team scored all those runs, the four runs in the seventh. Boy, meantime, Jorge Sosa, Steve, stitched together an impressive body of work.
but it unraveled courtesy of the bullpen. Giles into center. And the Braves will get that leadoff man on here in the eighth inning. They've got the Joneses coming up, Chipper and Andrew. There is action in the Houston bullpen. And Gallo down there, Springer. At some point, Phil Garner, you figure, is going to take Roy Oswald out. And when he does, there's going to be just an outpouring here from this crowd of appreciation for what he's done tonight. And for what he's done all season long, and this is what makes the Houston Astros so scary in the playoffs. Oswald, your number three starter. As we mentioned at the outset of this program, I mean, there is no team in the playoffs right now, in my opinion, that go three deep as well as the Astros, and anyone close, maybe the White Sox. It wasn't too long ago the Braves had the big three. It was Maddox and Glavin and Smoltz. And you're right, Steve. Nowadays, you sure can't do much better than Clemens and Pettit and Oswald. Chipper Jones on 2-0. Oh, to center for the out. Now with Andrew Jones coming up, we go to Chris Myers. Josh, at the start of the last inning, pitching coach Jim Hickey came over and sat down in front of Roy Oswald and then walked away and then came back and held up three fingers as if to say, give me three more outs. At least that's what he appeared to say before he'd take him out. We'll see how Roy holds up here. All right, Chris, thank you very much. And yeah, here comes Phil. And Steve, here comes the ovation. They rise is one. Roy Oswald threw 106 pitches. 70 of those pitches were for strikes. He's got a 7-2 lead. This is game three of the NLDS, Houston and Atlanta. Dan Wheeler is the new pitcher. One on, one out, eighth inning. Andrew Jones taking strike one. Nice year for Dan Wheeler, 71 games. Finally came into his own here as a pitcher. Phil Garner loves him. Using him and Qualls as the bridge to get to Brad Lidge. The bridge to Lidge getting very close right now. Lidge is loosening. Hammered fair, Andrew Jones. That is his third hit of the game. Giles is flying around third, being windmilled in. It is seven to three. This is exactly what the Braves need to do, just chip away. They still only have one out. They're not out of this ball game. They find a way to score two more runs this inning. You're right back in it. If he can keep guys getting on base. Unfortunately, the more runs you score, the more you're going to force Phil Garner to have to use Lidge. They don't kind of call him lights out for nothing. Andrew Jones just scalded that ball. Great hustle by Giles all the way around. If the Astros get a ballot, I bet you they vote for Andrew Jones for MVP. LaRoche takes down too low. The last 14 postseason games, Steve, between Atlanta and Houston, Andrew Jones has a hit in every one of those games with a batting average now of an even 500. Jeez. Clubbed in the air by LaRoche. Plenty of room out there for Tavares. And again, in Houston, we mean Paul Lenny of room in center field. <laughs> if you can negotiate that hill, that tricked up hill in center field, the flagpole in play, all that, man, there is some room to run. We saw Andrew Jones run one down out there in center field earlier. Tavares, they have said, has a little trouble judging fly balls at times, but the great speed, he can make up for a lot of his mistakes. 
Here is Fran Coor. No, he is not Roy Hobbs, but forgive any Atlanta fan who calls him the natural. Fran Coor was born the year that movie hit the theaters. <laughs> Frank Kerr is looking for something middle in here that he can pull hard into left field, try to get it up into the seats. On the edge, one and one. Wheeler keeping the ball away from him in the first two pitches. And folks, you can join Major League Baseball in the efforts to rebuild the Gulf Coast. Support Habitat for Humanity, calling 1-800-HABITAT to get it done. Or log on to MLB.com. Right, this is pretty good discipline from a guy who loves to go up there and swing the bat. He hits the ball into right center field very well, but I really think that he thinks he's got to pull the ball hard in this situation. He's seen th three pitches away from him, and he hasn't offered at any of them. That is the book, though, on Frank Poor, right? I mean, you can get him to chase. He's trying to quickly get some rewrite here. Well, he only walked 11 times in the 70 games that he was up. He went 131 at-bats before his first walk. But he has shown a little bit better patience so far in the playoffs. Little half-swing roller. Frank Hoare down the line. Of, no, no pick. Sounded like Seinfeld right there. What pick? There was no pick. <laughs> Close to a pick for Lamb. He couldn't quite hold it, and the inning continues. E6 on the throw. Well, it's just a half swing, and Adam Everett had a little bit of trouble getting the ball out of his glove. Now he has to throw it off the off foot. The ball's in the dirt. That's the toughest play right there for Mike Lamb to have to try to pick. Sort of an in-between hop. Frank Kerr's hustle is what made that play that much more difficult. A chance again, Steve, for the Kitty Core to shine. The 21-year-old Frank Kerr, now the 25-year-old Langer hands, the 21-year-old McCann is on deck. And Phil Garner is going to go to the mound. He is going to make that change in a 7-3 game. Game three favoring Houston right now. 7-3 in the eighth. Time for the Dell defining moment of the game. We take you back to Mike Lamb's third inning of home run. His first official at bat of this series. And it got Houston the lead. They added to it. Now they're trying to save it. The Braves have a run in in the eighth. And Mike Gallo just trying to, as you said, build that bridge to Lidge. Try to get it to the lights out closer. They bring in the lefty, and you knew a pinch hitter was going to come up. Are you surprised, Steve, it's going to be Brian Jordan and not Julio Franco? Well, I'm trying to guess along with him. He has Franco in the on-deck circle up behind Jordan. It's a Wilson Benamit, actually. Jordan strikes out a, a few times less. It makes a little bit better contact than Franco. Franco generally an opposite field hitter. If he wants Jordan to go up there and look to try to put one in the seats, it's a lot easier to pull the ball in the left field than it is to go in the right center field. Jordan on this date in this town six years ago put one in the seats to help win a game. He had all five runs batted in in a game three win in Houston against Atlanta. October the 8th of 1999. There is the 47-year-old Julio Franco sitting right next to Fercal. Jordan with three home runs on the year. Franco with nine. Brian Jordan at the Astrodome. Three for five, knocking in all five runs in the 5-3 win. I think they'd settle for two or three runs right here, huh? You bet. Double could get that done, the two. Off the back of the mound, Vigio. A little shuffle, and that'll do it. The bridge to Lidge is built. 7-3 Houston.
The Division Series on Fox, sponsored by the new Dell Plasma TV. No ordinary TV, it's the Dell. By T-Mobile, get more minutes, more features, more service. And by Chevy. Chevy and baseball, they just go together. An American revolution. Along with Steve Lyons and Chris Myers, Josh Lewin in Houston, where game three is a 7-3 lead for the Astros. Orlando Palmero pinch hitting, and he takes strike one. Palmero was the best pinch hitter for the Astros all season long. 15 pinch hits on the year. Gives you a good at-bat up there and has gap power. Ryan Jordan stays in the game playing left field. He made a leaping catch earlier in this series, robbing Adam Everett back in Atlanta. Boy, Josh, we talked about the problems that the Braves' bullpen has had all season long. In this series alone, the Penn's ERA is over 15. That ball popped out of play. In the meantime, the Houston starters continue to establish their collective worth. Pettit, I mean, what can you say about Pettit down the stretch? He was 15 and two following the first day of summer. ERA of a buck 67. You've got Oswald and you've got Clemens. He was another guy that all the Astros said if they played better behind him, he would have won 20 games. Start off the season four and seven. Now let's talk about Clemens, too. You know, supposedly after the 03 season, Clemens said he was 99.9% .9 sure that he would retire. The Astros are living large off that other 0.1%. So is he. Yeah. Paul Miro to center. One down. We go to Chris Myers. Josh, I'm standing near a rather confident uh, Astro dugout. The hometown Houston fans believe in their team, but it wasn't that way at the start of the season. Remember, this team was 15 and 30 towards the end of May, and at the beginning of June, the Houston Chronicle on the front page of the sports page buried the team, showing a headstone, a gravestone. And as you pointed out with Steve, the Astros, the first team since the 1914 Boston Braves to reach the postseason after being 15 games below 500 during the regular season. Now later the paper ran a lightning bolt going through the tombstone to try and correct things. <laughs> and, but you can't believe everything you read, but some of the players here actually told me that uh, even though that gravestone bit annoyed them, it did push some of their buttons. Vigio down in the count 0 and 2. Thanks, Chris. And yeah, you know, it's really true, Steve. Houston has been such a tough team to figure out all year. Every time you think zig, you get zag. Spring training, they were the trendy pick to win the Central, maybe win a World Series. Late May, they were 15 and 30. They were written off. Now they're the trendy pick to win a World Series again. A lot of people in this town saying, we're sorry. <laughs> there was talk up in the Metroplex of Dallas-Fort Worth that, hey, maybe Roger Clemens would waive his no-trade clause, come on up and help the Rangers out. You know, the Astros were going nowhere, 15 and 30. I'll tell you what, we talked a lot about that in game two and the job that Tim Papura did, the general manager of this club, sticking with the players that he believed in. He had a meeting after that with the players and said, no changes are going to be made. Biggio down on strikes, but it's been a heck of a night for him. There is Tim Papura on the left there. He came in and talked about everybody sitting next to Nolan Ryan. That's a good place to be sitting. He said, I believe in the players in this room. I put you together. I'm keeping you together. Go out and play baseball. You know what, though? If Tim had had a bad first year here as GM, safest place in the building is sitting next to Nolan Ryan. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. <laughs> now that Tim's had a great first year, here's Taveras. He's plugged in to this guy. Some large shoes to fill. Those of Carlos Beltran. But it is guys like Taveras and... Mike Lamb and Jason Lane, some of the guys that he has given an opportunity to play. And they have come through with flying colors for him. Little check swing. That is a much easier time of it in the bottom of the eighth than it was in the bottom of the seventh. That's the difference at four-run seventh.
Not a lot of sure things in your life, probably, but for Houston Astros fans, they feel pretty good about this. It's a four-run lead. They've got Brad Lidge on the mound. Doesn't get a whole lot better than that. This team went 77-1 and when leading after eight. They went 134 straight games before losing one when leading after eight. And that happened in the last week of the season. Brian McCann down 0-1. Defensive changes. Chris Burke into the game in left field now for Houston. Eric Bruntlett into the game at second. And Berkman now playing first. Wasting no time at all. That follows the outstanding effort of tonight's Chevrolet player of the game. That's Roy Oswalt. And in recognition of Roy's outstanding pitching, Chevrolet makes a $1,000 contribution to the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Chevy, an American revolution. Down to two outs to go here in game three. The Astros poised to take a 2-1 series lead in the best of five. And here is Julio Franco after all. Look out. 98 mile an hour heat. And that telephone pole of a bat goes flying. Swings one of the heaviest bats in the game. Still has that thing wrapped up around his head. 47 years old. And that's what he's willing to admit to. <laughs> he is older than eight current Major League managers. <laughs> But yeah, he can still swing. We've talked so much, Steve, about the baby Braves, Francoeur and McCann. When they were born, Franco already had, what, 600 major league at bats. Jeez. Now the lights out closer bringing the Astros very close now one and two one down ninth inning the Astros playing Franco they hit the ball the other way you see in the outfield there an opposite field hitter That's if you can find a way to get your bat on the ball. <laughs> Here you see Tavares out there in center field. Here's straight up center. Tavares shading into right center. <laughs> 26 of the last 27 save opportunities. No problem. 12.2 strikeouts per nine. Opposite field, like you said, base hit for the ageless wonder. You know, Phil Garner managed Franco back in 1997, Steve. He was 39 back then was Franco. Garner assumed he was about done. Look at this swing, though. That ball's off his ankles. That long bat, that weighs about 36 ounces. Still keeps his balance through the swing. Knows he wants to drive the ball the other way. Gets a piece of it. Drops it out there. Of course, you're 47. You can't <laughs> run any further than the first base, so you get a pinch runner for you. you. You've done plenty, Julio. Here, here's Pete Orr to pinch run. And it's back to the top of the order now for, for call. For a call, lifting it right field. Two down, ninth inning. Marcus Giles, a hitter. 
The Joneses loom on deck, but it could end right here. Quick turnaround, Steve. Game four is tomorrow around noon Central Time. Dr. Bobby talks about that. He said it doesn't make that much difference. It's the same for both clubs. Now that it's looking like his will be the club down 2-1. How about you? You asked me the question earlier. Who does... Bobby Cox come back with tomorrow to start that game. Be stunned if it wasn't Hudson now. Me too. Ball game. The Houston Astros are up two to one. We talked on and on about the Braves' kids, but it was some Houston veterans. How about B Craig Biggio, three doubles. The bullpen solid again. Just like last year, Steve, Astros take game one, Braves take game two, Astros take game three. Morgan Ensberg with another nice game. After the game one, we had five RBIs, comes back with two in this ballgame. Pretty decent team effort. Big sellout crowd, and don't underscore what that means, too. The last 100 games played in this building. 72 of those 100 games have been won by the home team. Lidge ends it with that strikeout. Again, there was plenty of offense to support Oswalt and Lidge in this game. One of the offensive stars standing by with Chris Myers. With Craig Vigio, three of the uh, seven doubles, this place electric tonight. How important was it to be home and to take this lead game in the series? Well, it's always nice. I mean, uh, last year, I mean, we got to really see what our crowds were all about in this building, and it's kind of one of the reasons I like to keep the roof closed. So, um, you know, they're, they're your 10th guy that's out there, but uh, we played well, got some good pitching defense, and I think the seventh inning was big for us. Now you have early batting practice uh, tomorrow, but one win away from getting back to the NLCS. Brandon Back, and we think uh, Tim Hudson, what do you think of the matchup? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Brandon He's done a nice job for us after he got hurt early in the year, but since he's been back, he's, been, he's given us a quality start every time he goes out there, and, um, you know, hopefully he can do the same tomorrow. All right, thanks, Craig. Good luck. All right, all right. appreciate it. Craig Biggio, let's go back upstairs, Josh. A division record three doubles. Thank you, Chris. Biggio and company get it done. Boy, on May 24th, the Astros were dead and buried. They were 15 and 30. They're up two games to one in this best of five. For more info on this game, Log on to FoxSports.com, powered by MSN. For Steve Lyons and Chris Myers, Josh Lewin saying so long from Houston. Jeannie and Kevin standing by. They'll be in the Fox Network Center. After these messages and a word from your local Fox station.